go. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming to the September uh, Reclaim Hosting Community Chat. Um, uh, I'm Taylor, and Jim's here from the Reclaim side. Um, and uh, we're uh, really happy to be joined by a, a bunch of folks from the Web Recorder team um, who are going to be chatting about the tools they make and doing a little demo. And we'll be talking about web archiving. So really excited. Um, I think this topic means a lot to a lot of folks, um, certainly in this call, but um, you know more broadly too. Um, and um, but I, I kind of want to start with if if you're here from the Web Recorder team to kind of introduce yourself. Um, I'm gonna kind of popcorn style, uh, so I'll, I'll 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 think I'll hand it to Ilya to start, and then um, you can uh, get, uh, pass the reins to someone else to introduce themselves. Sure, thanks, Taylor. Yeah, I'm Ilya Kramer. I'm the lead developer and creator of the Web Recorder project, and uh, yeah, our goal is to uh, build open source tools to make web archiving accessible for all. Uh, have a, a bunch of different tools that that we build and maintain, uh, and uh, it can be a complex process. And our goal is to make it as easy as possible. And uh, I think, yeah, we're, we're going to try to demo at least one of our tools during this call and kind of answer some questions uh, on on how, yeah, how things work. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, really happy to be here. And uh, I'll pass it to uh, I'll pass it to Henry. Sure. Hi, uh, I'm Henry. I am our sort of lead designer slash only designer at Web Recorder, uh, mostly focused on the UI UX design for browser tricks, but other applications when when necessary, when required. And lately, spending a lot of time uh, on our sort of updated website, which isn't quite live yet, but is in the pipeline. So look for it later soon-ish. I'm not giving dates because that's a bad thing to do. It's bad luck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll throw it to Camille. Hi, everyone. It's great to meet you. My name is Camille Lawrence. I am the program manager here at Web Recorder. I have a background in archives and digital collections. I do everything, a little bit of everything here. I've um, been focusing a lot more on creating educational materials for folks to bring in different communities to feel confident in web archiving, including journalists, dance organizations, teachers, etc. So it's great to see you all today. And I'm going to pass it to Tessa. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Tessa Walsh. I'm a senior developer at Web Recorder. Been here about two years. Uh, actually, maybe two years to the week, which is kind of fun. Um, and in a previous life, and still occasionally, I was a, an archivist and librarian, so I've been on sort of both sides of, of this. Uh, and uh, yeah, excited to be here with y'all today. Awesome. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, we're, we're we we got a couple things. I, I definitely have things I kind of want to chat about, but I think it makes most sense to maybe start with a demo. Um, and I think Tessa, you had lined up. Um, you could kind of talk about your uh, your all's tool, Browser Tricks, and kind of show folks what it does and what it's for. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Y'all can see the the shared screen there. Yes. Great. Uh, so this is uh, Browser Tricks. Uh, browser Tricks is uh, sort of our, our main focus uh, the last couple of years, and it combines a lot of our other open source tools into uh, a tool that is uh, also free and open source. Um, uh, and the idea is to be a sort of cloud native, uh, easy to use, intuitive uh, web archiving platform. Um, so let's just jump right in. Uh, if we want to crawl a new site, uh, what we're going to do is we'll go to create new here, and we'll create a crawl workflow. This is basically where you can set the configuration options to um, crawl a site. So if you just have one page or like a couple pages with, and you know what their URLs are, um, we have an option for that. We're going to do the option here that will um, actually go ahead and um, starting from a kind of root page, uh, it'll discover all the links and, and crawl uh, a whole website just from a single seed URL. Uh, so let's do reclaim hosting today. <laughs> um, there are a bunch of options here. Um, we can have it automatically check for a sitemap to discover pages. Um, we can um, set a one hop out, which will go um, uh, and capture links on the site that are on a different domain. Um, so if there's links to like 
YouTube or to other sites um, that have a different domain or a subdomain. We're going to keep it simple for now. Um, just for the sake of the demo, I'm going to set a limit here where it'll stop after 15 pages um, so that we um, can make sure that we'll finish on time. But there's a lot of other options here for things like timeouts and everything. Um, minimally, all you have to do to create a, a workflow is to enter a, a start URL um, and then click review and save and kick it off. Um, we're going to add a name here to this one as well. Um, one other thing I just want to point out while we're on this screen, um, a couple of the settings here that um, can be really useful are um, we have what are called browser profiles. And we can come back to this if people are interested in it. But essentially, because our crawler uses real browsers, before you kick off a crawl, you can open up a browser, uh, log into websites, accept cookies, and save that state and then use that for crawling. So if you want to crawl something behind a paywall or behind a login screen, you can go ahead and, and use a profile that's already logged in, and that'll work. Uh, that's really great for like social media sites, or uh, we have users who um, are uh, crawling uh, news sites um, where like things might be behind a paywall. Um, the other thing is you have the ability to schedule crawls if you want. So you can set up a crawl workflow once and then have it run regularly every month or every week. And I think we're going to be expanding these options a little bit um, sometime soon too. But let's go ahead and kick this off. So we click Save Workflow. And what's happening in the background uh, is um, Browser Tricks runs uh, on a platform called Kubernetes. Um, uh, that it's, uh, we don't need to get too into the details, but basically it's like a cloud native platform. So when you uh, click go ahead and start crawl, what it's doing in the background is it's spinning up um, new crawler containers um, that can be all on a single machine. It can be spread across a bunch of different machines. Uh, but basically, it's spinning up these containers that are each running real browsers uh, and then capturing the website using those real browsers, which lets us get better fidelity than something that's more of like a traditional like spider crawler type. Um, so you can see while the crawl's running, we um, can see the browser windows uh, as uh, the crawl is running. Um, so we can see exactly what the browser is doing. Um, this went really quickly. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, Our host is pretty good. So <laughs> yeah, no, no kidding. Um, that's one of the faster ones I've seen. <laughs> uh, so uh, there's a couple of things you can do once you have that crawl. Uh, you can go ahead and click right into the replay. So what we're looking at now is uh, a replay using our replay web page tool um, of that web archive completely from the archive. So nothing is being fetched from the live internet. This is all from what our crawler captured. Uh, and you can see that it does a, a pretty good job. Um, we can go in and we can start clicking through the pages. Now, because we set the limit to 15 pages, it's very possible that, you know, um, there are things I could click in here that it didn't get to just because we forced it to stop before. Um, but yeah, looks like that. So let's see if we go to the event calendar. Yeah, exactly. So here's a page that wasn't found in the archive. So you get a little screen that says not found. And you can go load it in the live web if you want or, or go back. Um, the files that are created uh, follow the, the Waxy specification, which we developed at Web Recorder. Uh, basically, it takes the ISO standardized work format for um, web archives uh, and wraps it into a zip file with a bunch of metadata and um, supplemental files like uh, indices and things that um, really help your web archive become portable. So you get one or more of these Waxy files, um, and you can download those. You can run them on your desktop. Um, actually, as a matter of fact, let's go ahead and I'm going to download that really quickly. And just to show you how portable it is, uh, we can go to replay web page, which is the hosted version of our, our the, the replay tool that we use in browser tricks. And I'm just going to go load in that Waxy that we just created. Um, one thing to know about Replay web page uh, is it's an entirely client side uh, replay engine. So when you upload a, a, a file to Replay web page, 
uh, it's not getting sent to a server anywhere. Everything that's happening is happening in your browser, um, which is really neat because you get to keep control of your data. Um, and it allows us to do um, a really high fidelity replay um, right in the browser, which is sort of the native environment. Uh, so you can see it's the same thing that we see in browser tricks. Uh, but this lets you, you know, you could copy that file, you can send it to someone, and you have a totally portable, self-encapsulated web archive um, just in one file. Uh, a newer feature that we have here is quality assurance. So from the crawl, um, we can see that the page list of what was crawled, as well as a little bit of information about what was in the crawl. So we have 14 HTML pages. And we have one thing that was basically at a URL that would indicate it was a page, but it's actually uh, a file. So maybe an image file or a video that we download bit for bit exactly 100% what it is. So um, we don't need to run QA on this because we know the file is what it is. But we can click Run Analysis here. And what our QA tools do is um, they compare screenshots and extracted text that were taken while the crawler was running. So while the real browser was looking at the website on the live web and capturing it uh, against um, our replay of those sites. So uh, the idea of this is that you can get a good high level view of how well um, your crawl actually did, how well the, the replay, the end result um, compares to what was on the live web. Um, and it can kind of point you to pages where um, maybe there were some issues, um, maybe uh, uh, maybe the browser needed more time to load a page before it was captured, maybe some of the other settings need to be changed. Um, and this is a, a fairly new thing for us um, and for any web archiving tools, frankly. Um, so it's still very much in a kind of development phase, um, but we've seen, especially with large crawls, um, it can be really, really useful for pointing out um, what did and didn't work well in an archive. Um, you can see as this is running, um, we're getting um, some indications of how well our capture worked. Uh, this seems to be very good so far. And when that finishes, we'll be able to click through into a review screen, which should be in just a second here. So is that, that's uh, obviously it's running right now. Um, if mm -hmm. you were, let's say I did a crawl like a week ago and then you ran the analysis just now, um, if the site changed, that may show up as inconsistencies, I'm guessing? Uh, it wouldn't because what we're comparing is the replay against what the browser saw on the live web while it was crawling. Basically, we take screenshots and extracted text at those different times um, and some information about what the different resources on the page are and um, what their status codes were, things like that. And then we compare it. Um, the only thing that would possibly change the relative success of the, the analysis um, over time is when we actually make improvements to our replay engine. Because sometimes when there are differences between what the browser saw on the live web versus the replay, it might just be that there's like a bug in a replay engine. We're aiming for you know perfect high interactive fidelity of every site, which you can imagine it's a bit of a cat, cat and mouse game, um, catching sure. up with, with oh, yeah. what everyone's doing on the web and all the new frameworks and things like that. Um, so, so it's yeah, not it's, literally doing like a new crawl to compare it against right now. It's using screenshots and text that it has as part of that crawl when it happened originally. Exactly. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, so it is actually recrawling the archive, basically. So we're not touching the live web anymore, but we are going over all of the pages that are in the archive and sort of recrawling it and then comparing those results with what we captured before. Cool. Uh, that's weird. Hold on. I have a feeling that... What in the world? Okay, that's new. Live demos, folks. <laughs> that's how, that's how it goes. New Off mysterious when you pull the dev tools out. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how it goes. Uh, that's really weird. I've, I've never seen that before. Maybe it got logged out or something. Yeah, here, uh, let me try rerunning that. Uh, and while that's running, um, we can go and um, I realize the reclaim sites are um, 
there's not a whole lot of like super interactive stuff. So I wanted to give another example of the community page on our current web recorder site to show like how like YouTube videos and things like that get captured as well. So we can do a really simple crawl here of just this one particular page. Uh, hey, YouTube. Let's give it a name. <laughs> let that run and again um as the crawl's running like right now it's spinning up resources in the background but as it starts we'll be able to see what the browser's doing in real time um the other thing that kind of glossed over here uh on the last crawl because it went so quickly is that uh you actually also get a real-time crawl queue um of uh all the pages that the the crawler has discovered and that it will go um visit um, and you're able to, like, on the fly, um, go ahead and uh, uh, change the queue by adding exclusions. So if there's, like, crawler traps, if sometimes, you know, like, a dateandtime.com or something where it's basically the same site but with endless query parameters and it'll just stay stuck on there, uh, you can go in and add um, uh, exclusions to say, like, okay, ignore this site totally or ignore um, this particular directory on the site or something like that. Uh, looks like our crawl finished again pretty quickly. So we'll go ahead and replay that. And you can see that uh, the site looks uh, just like it does um, on the live web and our embedded video from a previous community call. Web recorder also works uh, exactly as, as you would expect. The full video gets, gets fetched and included in the archive. Um, well, let's go ahead and we can run analysis on this as well. I think this one will probably show so see questo inconsistencies. Yeah, the autant, you know. Well, that's running. Let's go back and check our reclaim crawl. Yeah, here we go. I don't know what happened last time. That was that was really weird. I've never seen that. Uh, this is what the QA interface uh, looks like. Um, so we can see uh, we have a, a list of all of the pages in the archive. Um, by default, it's sorted by the worst screenshot match. The idea is that, you know, if you're crawling thousands of pages, massive sites, uh, we have people who crawl entire web domains, like top level domains, um, you are not probably going to check every page. But what we want to do is to facilitate your like human decision making by kind of guiding you to the, the pages that might need your attention. Um, so in this case, everything's really good, but we have like a 2% screenshot difference um, here. So we can go ahead and look at that. Um, per page, we have um, a screenshot view, an extracted text comparison, uh, a, a quick link to replay, um, as well as a kind of overview of the resources that are on the page. Uh, you can see here um, that the, the difference is that this VHS professional services image at the top didn't seem to load. Um, my guess would be that is just a timing issue with the way our QA process works, that the screenshot got taken before that image loaded. Um, you can see we have a, a toggleable screenshot view if you want to use a slider instead to like kind of more quickly figure out what the differences are. In this case, it's pretty easy to tell from the default view, but sometimes this can really help. Um, to test my hypothesis that the replay issue is just that it didn't, it was just a technical issue with the timing of the screenshot. You can go right into the replay and see, yeah, that image loads just fine on the replay. So uh, in that case, we would probably go ahead and say, yep, this page is good. Um, we can add a little note here saying just a timing issue. Replay has been checked. And then we could move on to our other pages if we want. Um, Let's sort by text. See, oh, these are all 100% different. So you get the text that was extracted, or 100% the same. You get all the text that was extracted during the crawl as well as um, during the analysis QA process. Uh, and if there are differences, they're, they're sort of highlighted in a diff in red here. Uh, I can show you that probably when we get back to the video. Uh, and then for now, we have this just sort of general breakdown of resources by roughly MIME type um, uh, that kind of gives you an idea of like um, 
the difference between what's included in the archive versus what's on the live web. Uh, this is still very experimental. Um, we've been trying to figure out what to do with this. In the actual Waxy files that the crawling and QA processes create, um, we have much more granular information, like per resource, URL, status type, uh, status code, MIME type, uh, and so on. Um, and we'll probably eventually figure out how to display this here. For now, it's just sort of uh, an interesting benchmark. I'm not sure how useful it always is. There are also quirks of the way that a replay works that sometimes show larger differences than are really there. Um, but it's just one more metric while it's in the kind of beta phase that you can look at. Um, and then say you say this is a larger crawl and there were pages with some problems, whatever, or like we want to say maybe we have an institutional workflow um, where we only download the Waxy files and include them in our digital repository um, when they've been reviewed and everyone says like A-OK. -okay. Um, so we have a feature here where you can add an actual score to the review, say excellent, and update the description. You like QA'd by Tessa on September 18th. And you can submit that review. And now back in our uh, archived items um, uh, list, you can see that that crawl that we created, um, the QA rating is there, and it's also sortable from among all the crawls in your, your organization of browser checks. Uh, so I'm gonna go back to our YouTube video. Oh, that was 100% too. Let me just find you a different one that's not. <laughs> Our crawlers are too good. It's too good. <laughs> um, do, 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 do. If you sort by like worst QA. Uh, yeah, that's a very good call. Okay, so here we have one. Um, this analysis was already run quite a while ago, um, but we can see sorted by worst text. Uh, the worst in this case is still a 97. Um, but I, what I wanted to show you is that, yeah, here's where how the differences are highlighted. So that the whole idea is trying to just use all of this um, sort of machine created information um, to bring human attention where it's most most needed and kind of make your job easier rather than trying to like replace the job of humans making good good decisions. Um, So that's our sort of core crawling um, use case. Uh, we have uh, a, another important feature is collections. Uh, this is how, this is our, our feature for basically curating and sharing um, the web archives that you create. So we can create a new collection and we'll call this reclaim community call, give it a little description. Oh, we support markdown now, that's fun. Uh, and then once we have created a collection, we can add items to it. So the idea here is that um, you can uh, you can combine uh, crawls or uploaded Waxy files that were created with other tools, like our archive web page tool that lets you sort of like manually archive content in in Chrome as you browse. Um, and you can merge them together into a single collection. So say for, you know, we wanted to create a publicly shareable archive um, that contained both the web, rec web recorder community call um, uh, page and uh, our reclaim hosting crawl. Uh, we can go ahead and select those. Um, there's a little breakdown. These are grouped by the crawl workflows. So if we had run these workflows multiple times, you'd have different versions of the crawls and you could select which ones you want. We also have an option here to auto add um, new crawls from a workflow to the collection. So if we turned this on, for example, for reclaim, every time we ran this crawl in the future, whether that was a scheduled job or whether we're manually running it, um, the new crawl content would automatically get uploaded to this, this collection that we're creating uh, without us needing to go manually do anything. So let's add these two together. And then we can see in the replay tab, what we get is, uh, yeah, a combined archive that contains uh, both of these sites. Um, so this can be really useful if you want to create a curated collection around a particular topic, uh, or if you want to um, gather, say, like a bunch of student portfolios together, or if you have a page where the automated crawl was uh, really, a site where the automated crawl was really good, except for like one page that has 
super interactive stuff that requires a lot of user interaction. Um, you could go use archive web page to capture that super, super like that page that requires more manual interaction and then combine the two together. So you have a single patched uh, uh, collection of that whole website exactly the way you want it. Um, neat thing here is that with this collection now, um, by default, it's it's private. So only people who can log into this, this site um, can see it, uh, but we can make it shareable. Uh, and then uh, we're given a link that we can give to anyone on the web um, that will be able to guide them into just this one collection. So if you want to put that link on like, um, you know, link out from an Omeka site or whatever, um, you have that ability. Um, and you can even um, embed this collection into uh, any existing web page. Um, so our replay web page engine that we've already talked about a couple times has the ability to be um, embedded on any site. Uh, and all you have to do is add this tag. Uh, replay web page is a, a web component. So we have basically a custom uh, HTML tag. Uh, and then you need to import uh, a service worker, um, uh, which is what it uses on the, in the back end to um, actually do the replay. Um, and we have a link to our whole embedding guide here. But what this lets you do is um, institute. Uh, I'll show you one good example. Uh, there's a, a digital archive called um, the Feminist Institute um, that's really wonderful. Uh, and they have um, archived websites as part of their digital archive um, that they created using web recorder tools. And they're using um, this embedded uh, replay web page tool to actually include the replay of this directly uh, in their digital archive. Um, so you go to their site and, you know, there's all the metadata about this capture and this website. Um, and then uh, you have the actual embedded archive right there um, that people can, can interact with, uh, which I, I think is really neat. Uh, so you could, you could do that on a static site. You could put that into, um, uh, uh, we, you know, we've had people talking about like um, uh, figuring out, uh, putting these into like WordPress sites. Um, so you can bring the content right where it is instead of always having to like link out to, to some different like web archiving uh, friendly site or something like that. The important thing for me too that I love about the way that these tools work is that you can choose whether the archive, whether that actual file lives on, um, say in this case, in browser tricks, like on your platform if you want it there, or you can take the file and host it really anywhere. And it's, it's pretty easy to do. You don't need specialized hosting. So you can choose make that decision based on what makes sense for your archiving project. Totally, yeah. Um, and I would say we even encourage people to do that. Um, like even if you're a hosted uh, user, like a, you're a customer of the, our hosted uh, browser tricks product, um, <clears throat> you know, we still encourage people to download all their stuff out, uh, create extra backups, use them wherever you want. Um, we're working on features uh, in the future so that you can, for example, bring your own S3 bucket to use with browser tricks. So you don't have to rely on whatever cloud platforms we're using for storage. If you want to use your institutional storage or something like that. Um, I think our, our MO is, is very often just like putting the, the power in the hands of the people who are doing this stuff. Uh, and, you know, we want to give you options for convenience. Um, they're definitely um, certain benefits to using like, you know, cloud hosted software where maintenance efforts are directed and stuff, but we want you to be able to create these high fidelity archives of the sites that matter to you and then do whatever you want or need with them. Uh, the idea is to, to really like empower folks as much as possible. Um, the other thing here is a uh, browser profile. So I mentioned this briefly before, but I can, I can give you a, a little demo. Um, so what we're going to do, I don't really, um, we'll do a very simple version of this just to just show the concept. Um, but when we create a new browser profile, uh, what this has done is it spun up a browser in the background. Uh, we use Brave Browser, which is based on Chromium, um, but has a bunch of nice extra features um, that we take advantage of. Uh, like native support for adding cookie blocking, uh, which is really nice. Um, but uh, Brave is quite uh, customizable. So in this this browser that we've spun up, 
spun up, we could go into the Brave settings page and say, for example, we want to turn all of the ad and cookie blocking stuff off uh, because we have a particular site where like the ads are of importance. Um, we can go in and we can uh, start changing the, well, they change the interface on this a little bit. Usually it's under shields on the side. Oh, yeah, I just clicked on the wrong thing. Thank you. Um, we can change uh, the default settings. That explains why the UI was different. Um, we can change the default settings. So maybe we're not going to block fingerprinting. We're not going to block cookies. Um, we're not going to uh, try to block trackers and ads. Um, and we could go ahead and save this profile. And we'll say Brave with no ad blocking. And then if we are gonna go create a new uh, site, like say we have, uh, gonna go create a new crawl, say we have like example.com with important ads, I don't know. Uh, you can go into the browser settings here and uh, select that browser profile uh, and it'll actually crawl with this profile. So it'll like turn off all of those, those ad and cookie blocking settings. Uh, and so you can do the same thing, um, uh, signing into Instagram and then crawling a personalized Instagram page or like behind a paywall, logging into a news site. Um, if, if you want to um, like set certain cookie settings and then crawl with those that aren't necessarily login related. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of, oh, go ahead, Ilya. Yeah, uh, I was just gonna add, yeah, a, a common example of this is, is uh, sort of the opposite where, 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 a, where a page has uh, a bunch of cookie pop-ups, such as a lot of news sites do, and and you don't want to crawl with them, so you can create a profile, and you click them, uh, and you, uh, yeah, and then basically you say, okay, don't show this again. I accept cookies, and then that that doesn't appear in the crawl. So, for example, I don't know, like uh, I think theguardian.com is one example that has that. Um, uh, but yeah, but many many sites have have these pop-ups that are obviously they're there for a reason, but they're very detrimental to crawling because you, you don't want to see this every time. Um, and so you just want to accept this once and then you run your crawl with, with that pop-up already, uh, already gone. Um, so that's, a, that's a common use case for this as well as logging in, uh, bypassing paywalls and so forth. Um, that's that's really cool, and the um, the fact that you can do that all interactively makes that I mean a lot easier. I, I can't think of a use case, but I'm guessing you could even do things like load extensions, um, do some just because you have access, you, you can change a lot of different settings. I could see you already mentioned um, the just logging in, which I think for um, for folks uh, who do uh, hosting with Reclaim. Could be really really valuable we have plenty of people who have like wordpress multi-site networks where some of the sites are only available to folks in that community logged in via like single sign-on things like that um all of that could be really really valuable <laughs> uh isn't that great so we accepted that one pop-up and then they just they just serve up a different one but we can go back into that the the browser profile and click through that and you you can see how the process works. Uh, yeah, most so sites aren't quite so aggressively awful with the banners, <laughs> but there are a lot of there are a lot of GR, GDPR consent banners out there. Yeah, you know, they're they're more and more common. I think we all see them all the time. So it's nice to be able to uh, uh, circumvent those to some degree. Yeah, and then they they can also show different pop ups based on different regions and so a new feature that that we have uh hopefully coming soon is uh, the ability to crawl from different locations uh so we'll have uh, a way to configure so right now this is running in our uh, i believe our uh, amsterdam data center mm -hmm. uh we're adding a way for users in that workflow configuration screen to be able to configure uh from different proxies so we can configure proxies in different countries uh mostly where where we have customers uh, so that, for example, if you're 
located in Australia or New Zealand, uh, and you want to crawl content the way that it appears in your country, uh, we'll have a proxy that allows you to configure that. Uh, or if you're in US or Canada or so, or so forth, uh, yes, yeah, so that's that's a new feature that, that we're working on to kind of further customize the crawling because these things are subtly different in, in, in different regions as, as we often find. Yeah. Uh, so our crawl's finished and you can see that in the replay we don't have that banner, which is great. Um, the other thing I don't know, I, I realized I, I didn't mention explicitly is when this last crawl was running, you could see if, if, you, if anyone's lo looking at the screen that you can like watch the browser scrolling through the site uh, or scrolling through the page. Um, so we have a bunch of uh, what we call behaviors uh, that are sort of automated behaviors that can guide the site a bit. So one of those is auto scroll. So if a page, um, uh, you know, that the, the browser can, uh, with our behaviors can go ahead and scroll through the whole site. So for example, if there's like infinite scroll or whatever, it can keep scrolling until you hit whatever timeouts are configured, uh, which can be really great for, for sites where you can only discover content that way. Um, and we also have specific behaviors for various social media sites um, that know how to like click on certain things so that you get uh, the posts and comments. Uh, I'll say the social media sites are um, definitely probably our biggest cat and mouse game. They're they're changing all the time, so it's a lot of it's a lot of work to keep parity with those changes. Um, but we, uh, I think we still do a pretty good job of it. Um, and and that is content that is um, particularly difficult uh, uh, to capture, like with any tools, really. Um, so we're trying to trying to give people a leg up there. Uh, I think that the, the, that's sort of the the, the, the broad overview. Um, very happy to answer questions or show off particular things. People are, are interested in something uh, specific. Sure. Um, I, if, if folks have questions, um, of course, they can put them in the chat or just speak up. Um, you're welcome to do uh, whatever makes sense. Um, I did want to kind of prod you too a little bit with so with browser tricks, um, how can people use this? <laughs> right. Um, so uh, that is a very good question. Uh, you can go, if you want to just get started um, the easiest, fastest way, uh, you can go right to browsertricks.com um, and scroll down to the page or click uh, start crawling here. And um, this is a, a fairly new thing for us, but we have um, uh, a Stripe integration now um, that makes it really easy to just uh, completely self-serve, sign up for a plan uh, and manage your subscription. Um, so we have a starter plan starting at $30 a month um, that comes with a particular amount of crawling time and disk space. Uh, and then we have some plans um, that have uh, a, a bit higher, um, you know, more, the ability to run more than one crawl at a time, um, more pages per crawl, more crawling time and disk space. Uh, in general, our model is that we um, uh, we try not to um, gatekeep certain features by like level of plan. Um, our plans are mostly spread out across uh, resource usage, so like where our costs actually come. So the amount of concurrent crawls that you can be running at a time, how much crawling time you have, um, and that that's all really based off of um, uh, the compute. Like the crawling time is how much time these browsers are, are literally spending down to the minute and second uh, crawling stuff on the web. Um, and so the, the model that we've come up with is um, a monthly quota where you get a certain amount of crawling time per, per month. Uh, and then at the beginning of the next month, that, that resets. Uh, we also have um, <clears throat> uh, larger plans for institutions, for, for bigger teams, for people doing much larger crawling. Uh, you know, if you want to be crawling huge sites all the time, if you want to be having a bunch of regular scheduled crawls that would go over the limits of our sort of basic self-serve plans. Um, and for that, the person to talk to is Camille, who is here. Um, but even from the site, you can click this link to schedule a demo um, and um, book a time with Camille on Calendly um, to, uh, yeah, have a demo, um, uh, talk about the different options and the different pricing tiers. Uh, you know, we want to work with people to, to come up with the best solutions for them. Um, so this is the easiest way to, to run browser tricks. Uh, as free and open source software, you're also very welcome to just uh, run and deploy it yourself. Uh, and we have documentation for that. 
um, uh, to our deployment guide here um, talks through exactly how um, to deploy it. Uh, it requires a running Kubernetes cluster um, and a, a certain amount of kind of technical know-how um, around that. Uh, but uh, certainly as a way of trying it out or if you have local, um, you know, if, if a local deployment suits you better um, then using a hosted service, that, that's always an option too. We're, we're pretty committed to all of our tools being a, a free and open source. Awesome. Um, so we do have a couple questions um, and um, I can kind of, uh, you know, uh, whoever wants to answer them, some of them I can speak to a little bit, but um, I'll kind of go, um, I actually wanted to bring Jim's uh, question here too. Um, and we have some that are sort of, sort of directed at us at Reclaim too that we can get into a little bit later. But um, the uh, how would this, how does this compare like, Jim's question, I should just read it. <laughs> this could be really great for universities to manage. How does it compare to archive it in terms of scope of archiving a large site? Like, I don't know um, the capability differences there. Yeah, it's uh, a really good question. Um, maybe I can start with that and then open it up to the, the team if, if they have other thoughts. Um, I, I think the, the kind of the, the core differences at this point are that, um, Browser Tricks has the crawling capabilities to do things that Archivit currently cannot. Things like uh, crawling behind paywalls or social media sites that require our kind of browser-based approach uh, and the use of browser profiles um, to do um, currently. Uh, so there are there are types of paywalled or interactive sites um, where Browser Tricks is just going to be able to create a higher fidelity. Uh, capture than what um, Archivit's tools can currently do. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Archivit uh, has a very different model, right? Because they're partnered with the largest web archive in the world. Um, so when you crawl things with uh, Archivit, they um, become included as part of the, the Internet Archives collections and kind of viewable through their, their public interface. And that, that's not something that we have currently. Our curation and sharing features are um, uh, much more pointed, as I showed you, of like creating specific curated collections that you're then able to share. Uh, we don't have like a, a public index page with, you know, all of the archives created by a bunch of different institutions and in, in the way that that Archivit does. Um, so I, I'd say they're complementary services, and I think depending on what your depending on what your needs are, uh, I don't think there's anything that Archivit's crawler does that that Browser Tricks um, doesn't do. Um, uh, so we've had institutions who have been Archivit customers who are interested in just full sale switching over. We've got people who plan to use both. Uh, we have people who, you know, are running their own crawling tools as well as one or both of these um, other tools. I, I think it really, uh, it depends on your use cases um, and what you're doing. I, um, you know, as biased as I am, I don't think there's like a clear, like one is, just leagues better than the other across all uh, uh, all possible criteria kind of answer here. Uh, I, I will say I are uh, it is on our mind uh, moving forward in the next year or so to um, improve our collection features and uh, make it easier for people to find on the public web um, shareable collections and things like that. So uh, it's definitely something that we're planning on working on, um, but it's still very much in the early uh, early stages of sort of design and architecture. The other thing I, I want to add is that uh, the output of Browtrick is specifically designed for sort of portability and mm -hmm. and self hosting, so that uh, all of the crawl outputs are in the Waxy format, which we then have our free tools that you can then take with you and host on your own site, uh, as we've shown with with. Uh, uh, the SUP site and the, uh, the Feminist Institute site. So once once you're done, the data is yours, uh, and you can host it on your own and not be dependent on us. I think with with archive, it, it's a little bit more complicated because the data is stored in the internet archive. It's hard to get it out, uh, and it's hard to then self-host it without doing a bunch of extra work. Um, we try to make it easy for people to get their data in. Uh, essentially do whatever they want with it, including keeping it private. So, uh, because we sort of have a 
a private by default model rather than a uh, always public by default, but, uh, which is also kind of a, a, another difference. I would just I would add as well that I think that the ecosystem of tools you all have built here around browser tricks is stronger too. So it's kind of hard to if you aren't doing archiving on archive it, you can't you can you can do things like take a, a browser tricks crawl and in you know um, recrawl a certain page and things like that or you can run some of the back end tools that do this crawling at the command line if you're comfortable with that um, a lot of that stuff is harder to do in the archive it ecosystem those tools are either not available or just are in my experience anyway very difficult to use so that's as a as a not someone not on the team, I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Um, yeah. Uh, so a couple other questions um, I'll mention. So we had someone ask about um, uh, browser tricks. Uh, so browser tricks is open source. Is there will be support for uh, any kind of integration with Reclaim Cloud? So I can kind of answer that. Um, the uh, so browser tricks to run it yourself, uh, you need a Kubernetes cluster, um, and you can run Kubernetes on Reclaim Cloud. So it is possible to do. We don't have a installer for it, um, and but it is something I'm very interested in providing. If folks wanted to make that um, easy to run on our platform, um, I'll just be completely transparent. The reason we haven't done anything like that just yet is. Um, we're kind of weighing the the Kubernetes is is a thing, <laughs> and, and so I wouldn't necessarily, you know, uh, give a Kubernetes cl cluster that's pre configured to any like say student and just say here you go. Um, I, you, there are some things you do need to know about administering Kubernetes in the long term. So while we could theoretically make an installer that says here it is, it works, I would be concerned about the long term viability of that for a customer. Um, who doesn't know anything about Kubernetes. And for the purposes of archiving, I think that is a, a particularly important concern. People need these things to work in the long run. So uh, internally at Reclaim, we're thinking through like what would make the most sense, but you know, we could, we, I could see a, a day where we have, you know, detailed instructions or, or something like that. Um, and then uh, someone mentioned the idea of a Reclaim instance um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe uh, it's we're we're we we do have we're big fans at Reclaim of these tools that you all have created, um, and, and we do have um, uh, a installer on Reclaim Cloud for basically a script um, that it doesn't do nearly as much as uh, Browser Tricks does, um, but it can um, basically you can give it a at the command line a URL and it can archive a. Uh, an entire domain or or a, a directory of a site, um, and that's something you can run on Reclaim Cloud, and there is an installer for, um, and you can use right now if you wanted to. Um, but I'll also just mention that if you have a site that has a limited amount of pages, you know, um, let's say like less than a hundred pages, you can just go to archiveweb.page uh, and install the extension and make archives that way, um, and then those are hostable wherever you want. So. Yeah, we didn't show it off here, but archive web page is, is a really great way to like just get started right now. Uh, if you have that sort of limited scope, because you will have to browse everything manually. I don't think we have time for like a full demo of that today, but, uh, but do check it out. It's a good, also made by us. It's a good tool. Yeah. I, I, I could give like a three minute version of the demo if people want, but also happy to just leave space for us to keep talking. I think Camille um, also wanted to say something. Yeah, absolutely. I just also wanted to jump in um, and remind people of how easy it is to navigate browser tricks, no matter your level of digital literacy. Um, and I think one of the great value points of the browser tricks tool online that's hosted by us is that we do not charge folks for additional user seats. So if you are collaborating with folks anywhere in the world, um, the advantage of using the hosted service is that no matter where you are, you can collaborate together. Um, you can build web archive collections together, um, and you can still have the ability to sort through your archived items by the username. 
um, whereas some other organizations may charge astronomical rates to add multiple users to an account. So we try our best to make things flexible and accessible. And as you can see, you can self-host, you can use the manual browser extension, um, but we really did try our best to optimize BrowserTrick's hosted service to be inclusive of all organizations' needs. So no matter if you're a journalist, if you're a student, if you're an educator, if you're a musician, um, if you're a dance organization, we have a wide range of users who are actively web archiving. So yeah. And I just wanted to add uh, uh, to you know, what, what Taylor was saying and, and, and what other folks were saying. Yeah, probably if they were to have a, um, Probably the, the simplest integration with if if Reclaim were to were to host this would be kind of a a single instance for Reclaim that that Reclaim users could then run their own curls on rather than having each each customer deploy their own. But I think browser is sort of designed for for that sort of setup where there's one instance and multiple orgs or or, or users that uh, that that run crawls uh, and that way you don't have to redeploy it every single time. Um, so yeah, I wonder. I'm sorry, Ilya. I don't mean to interrupt you. I'm I'm just wondering, like, with with you all, how do you see it? Like, do you see one-off users using this? Because, like, I would. I know Mark is saying Reclaim should host it, but we probably won't because that's what you all do and you do it well. But I could see this really as a sweet spot for universities, colleges, folks who really want to get out in front of their archiving and help maybe students and faculty archive their stuff like Shannon was talking about. Um, but I don't know if individual one-off archiving, they could probably do that just as well as backing up their files and database, right? So I wonder if like you're, the sweet spot is really the universities and I'd much rather them manage it through mm -hmm. you all than come through Reclaim. Probably wouldn't make sense, right? I think, That's it, dep I think it depends. Um, like our users run from giant national web archiving programs that are archiving their, you know, their entire country's top level domains to like universities to, we, we do have some um, small businesses and individuals who sign up um, just to do stuff for themselves. I think, for example, like if you are a designer or a digital content creator who then hands off your work product uh, to the client where it goes lives on the web, but like will eventually get taken down or changed. It's really nice to have these like super high fidelity interactive web archives that are um, a little better quality and more portable than you might get with like um, just kind of backing up the files. Um, it also opens up some interesting, and I think this goes exactly with what you were saying, Jim, with like universities providing services to their communities. Um, it opens up really interesting possibilities for things like digital humanities projects that are grant funded and then end. And then you're like hosting this site that needs to have a database server and all this other stuff. But if the content's not changing, just create a web archive of it and serve up that web archive. And we have ways of doing that where it's not even, people don't even necessarily need to know that it's being served from an archive. Uh, yeah. And so like Stanford University Press, for example, has done that with a bunch of their digital projects where the, the lot, the live ones are still on the web, but they also have a link to like, uh, here's the archive site and probably eventually um, the archive site will be the more sustainable uh, solution, you know, 10, 10, 15 years down the line, rather than like continuing to support uh, old frameworks, uh, having to manage the database over time, things like that. I think and you're absolutely right. That's, that's for me right on. And that's why I like seeing Stanford or other schools saying, yeah, or Shannon, even folks at UMW or wherever, seeing that as a tool that they can now put alongside hosting and everything. And I'm just like, why shouldn't you all run it and do with it? Because you built the tool. Putting Reclaim in the middle could be useful if we offloaded it to you to do all the kind of work. But like, it's not really our, like, you know, like we want to do hosting well. And I think we want to work with people who do archiving well, right? I yeah, think, yeah, yeah. I think we're going to miss lose Taylor because Taylor wants to come over to Web Recorder team. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I kind of think that that it's important. Like, I, I think most people, the hosted solution you all provide is what makes the most sense. And I would say the, that now that folks can sign up for $30, you know, like the, the, if you look at the limits on there, like three hours of crawling is actually kind of a lot of crawling time. Um, you know, most people won't get close to that. Um, and I would even say some smaller departments could even use that plan. 
uh, depending on what they need, what their needs are. So I think that makes sense. But I really like the way you all have done gone about this work because I think the option to self-host it for people that um, need it, but really as a provision, is really important in this field, right? Because I'm thinking like really long term, right? Like what if we're talking about web archiving and none of us on this call are involved in it anymore? I think there's stuff like that that I think having these tools be open source and self-hostable um, is just really important <laughs> that that's how they're built. Yeah, that, that, that all makes sense. Yeah, and, and I think, uh, yeah, definitely. So we're, we're definitely in the, in the archiving business and, and we don't really want to be in the hosting business and that's, that's kind of the opposite for you. So I think, yeah, I think we could perhaps figure out a way to, to, to collaborate where maybe archives are created through BrowserTrix hosted service and then are moved to Reclaim Cloud for longer term storage uh, and, and for the uh, presentation layer of that. So yeah, that, maybe that's uh, sort of the sweet spot in terms of integration opportunities. You know, I, I was thinking, you know, folks, like one of the things that I, I just saw a presentation on and it comes up again and again is this idea of like personal archiving. And it kind of goes, Henry, to some of the stuff you're sharing there, um, although it's part of an organization. But like, you know, what would be the sweet spot for someone to be able to archive their site who's just got a pretty simple site and they just want to have an archive of it and have it regularly run? And maybe 30 bucks is not the is not the, the number for them. Um, but like this idea of like personal archiving where it's a little bit cheaper, but also it's a simple site. Um, and maybe it runs off of just one you provide almost like a WordPress.com, right? Um, but it would be interesting to kind of promote personal archiving, save your stuff, um, and also get a bunch of little sites um, as well and alongside the bigger organizational sites where people are going to charge, pay more and need to pay more. So I don't know if that's a space for you because the starter I could see some people being like, uh, you know, 30 bucks is a little bit much for my small site, but maybe not. I don't know. Sorry. I got a, I, Camille's maybe going to kick me for saying this, but there's a fun secret about SaaS cloud services, which is uh, you, you, you don't have to keep paying for it every month. You can just download all the stuff. <laughs> and so if you, if you pay 30 bucks, you go, you archive your site, maybe that's worth it to you. You have the copy as like a nice waxy and then you can host it. Uh, I mean, that, that might be the move for some of those types of people that don't need the continuous ongoing access. Uh, and I uh, go try that out. You know, it's a, it, it's a $30 <laughs> Camille's messaging me. She's like, stop. Uh, <laughs> it's a $30 payment. Like, maybe that's worth it for you especially if your scope is small and especially if it's a one-time thing uh yeah you do that once a year right that's that's exactly yeah and then then you're getting what you need out of it uh for those larger people of course you know as your as your needs with archiving might increase it it might be worth it to you to not have to constantly like download all your stuff and you can just post our link up somewhere you don't have to go through the whole self-hosting process that i mentioned in chat uh it depends on the user who this will be useful for. Yeah, that makes total sense. Well, so we're we're at the hour. Um, so it, I know some folks have to run for meetings and things like that. Um, but um, I'll kind of hang out as people trickle out. Um, but I I just wanted to thank the whole, uh, web recorder team. Um, thanks Tessa for doing such a great demo. Um, yeah, we're big fans here at, at Reclaim of all the work you all are doing. And thanks for joining us and chatting about the tools. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, and we'll continue conversations on, on how we could work together. And, and yeah, hopefully this will be useful for folks.